You guys hear me okay? Not the most ideal, is it? <laughs> All right. So I have with me today Dr. Brian Kaminsky, who is the medical director of ProMedica Flower Hospital. Uh, so I'm going to talk for a couple minutes uh, and turn it over to the doctor. Uh, he sees COVID patients every, every day. He's going to talk about what he's seeing and what they're seeing in, in the hospital. Uh, I wanted to be here in Northwest Ohio today to really give you a report of what we are seeing. Uh, this fire is burning strong uh, throughout Northwest Ohio. Uh, if you look at every county, every county uh, has a very high incidence of cases. Uh, this, is a, this is a list, the different counties, and what you can see, you can't see it, but uh, what we have here is every single county in Northwest Ohio is at least five times uh, as high as the what the CDC says is the high incident level. So uh, this is we've never seen anything like this. Um, in the spring we didn't have this. Uh, in the summer we did not have it. What we're now seeing is this virus uh, permeating every part of the state. Uh, so early on, if you were in a rural county in the spring, you probably didn't see much of, of the COVID. You might not have known anyone who had COVID. Uh, today, uh, you cannot you cannot escape it. In fact, our uh, small rural counties are hotter. Uh, they have more cases many times than even our our urban urban counties. Uh, so, what do we do about this? Um, you know, let me just start by saying what this threatens. This threatens keeping our schools open, our kids in school. Um, when you have widespread community spread, it threatens the nursing homes, our loved ones in the nursing homes, and it threatens our hospitals and the ability of hospitals to carry out their function uh, every, every single day. Um, what are we doing about it? Uh, the curfew that we put in place will start tomorrow night at 10 o'clock. Uh, we hope that that will, will help. We believe it will help. Uh, but we're also asking um, everyone to pull back a little bit, pull back from your personal contacts with, with other people. Um, the curfew in and of itself will be helpful, uh, but it's frankly just as important, maybe more important, what people do in their individual lives. So, you know, we're kind of we're kind of back back to basics. Uh, you know, wear a mask, um, keep some distance. But every day, I'm asking every Ohioan to find ways to pull back a little bit. Uh, do some of the things that we did in the spring when we said, look, we're only going to the grocery store once a week. We're only going to make this trip once. Um, you know, if you have the opportunity and you want to do carry out, you know, do something kind, do carry out for your neighbor. Take it over to their door. Um, these are all things that we can do during this time of crisis, and I think we have to look at this as a time of crisis. There is great news, uh, and the great news in the last few days, we have seen two uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, that are telling us they're almost ready to roll. Uh, we expect to start getting some of the vaccine, uh, we hope, in December. We're going to get that first out to our most vulnerable. Uh, that is the people in the nursing homes. We're going to try to really build a wall around our nursing homes by getting people uh, who work in the nursing homes um, inoculated, uh, getting them the vaccine, uh, and really protecting our most vulnerable. From there, we're going to move directly into our medical teams that are out there in the, in the uh, forefront uh, every single day trying to protect us. So let me just stop at this point, and uh, we'll, we'll wait till that plane takes off.
right. Well, that was quite a welcome for the governor, I would say. Uh, thank you, Governor DeWine. Thank you for your support, for your focus, and for uh, all you've done as it relates to Ohio's response to the pandemic. We're very grateful for everything that we've received from the state. We're also grateful for our local health department, who served as a guiding beacon during the response to this pandemic. And we're grateful for our other health care systems that work in the Northwest Ohio uh, in a collaborative fashion in fighting the response to the pandemic. The impact has been wide ranging, as many of us know. Uh, we see people with no symptoms, we see people with very minimal symptoms, and we see people with severe illness hospitalized, hospitalized sometimes in the ICU, and in the worst cases, we're seeing people actually succumb to the illness. We also see this group of patients that uh, many people don't hear about, but we're going to be hearing about them more often. It's uh, a group we call the long haulers. So uh, people who get the illness, uh, they survive, but they go on to have significant symptoms. We don't know the long-term impacts of COVID, but what we're seeing is we're seeing people who contracted the illness even in the spring and are still having symptoms from this. That's a separate group of people that we're going to learn more about over time. COVID cases in Lucas County and the surrounding areas are trending upward at an alarming rate. The number of hospitalized patients in our system has increased dramatically. When I actually first wrote these talking points just two days ago, I was set to say that our rate of hospitalized patients has doubled, but unfortunately I have to say now that our rate of hospitalized patients in the last three weeks has tripled. So you can see the increase and the concern that we have over the progression of the disease. We expect that number to grow, unfortunately. The number of patients being admitted, admitted to the hospital keeps going upwards. I just want to be very clear that there's no doubt that our hospital systems, our healthcare systems, will become overwhelmed. One of the reasons we're seeing such an uptick is the weather change. You can tell it's a cool day now, the humidity is down, and we know that the disease tr transmits more readily in low levels of humidity. We fear that we're at the beginning of some of our darkest days yet just because of this trend that we see. We don't know how bad things will get, but we know that how bad they get is generally up to the public and the measures that we take to prevent the virus. More than ever, we need our community to come together, to take actions, to do those things that we know reduce transmission. There's a reason that you keep hearing us repeat the three W's. We sound like a broken record, but washing your hands, watching your distance, and wearing a mask really do make a difference. The science is out there. It's a minor inconvenience, but it actually saves lives. When a vaccine becomes available, it's going to be a great relief. Governor DeWine referred to a vaccine, and that is great news, but we're not there yet. We know that it's going to take up until mid to late summer to vaccinate all of our population, so we really need to buckle down now more than ever. You're also hearing a need to limit gatherings. I know we have the holiday season coming up, Thanksgiving and Christmas, when people like to get together, but we want to strongly advise everybody to reconsider that. Uh, reconsider spending time with people outside of your own household. We know that that takes a huge emotional toll and we'd never ask it if we didn't think it was going to save lives. We also want to reassure you that our health care providers and our health care systems are doing absolutely everything they can across to Toledo to work together to prevent the impact of this pandemic. We're sharing resources, we're sharing knowledge, we're sharing data, we work collaboratively. Even though we live in a competitive healthcare environment, there is no competition when it comes to this pandemic. We work closely and collaboratively, and it's a great relationship up here in Northwest Ohio. Uh, we also have surge plans in place. So all of our hospitals and our hospital systems have surge plans in place to help increase capacity and to help cross-train our staff members so that uh, we can maximize the use of our existing resources. Uh, that has its limits as well, so that does not go on infinitely. And as the volume increases, we, could, we are concerned that we could run out of that resource as well. Staffing is a major concern right now. Our healthcare workers live and work in our community. They're not only exposed in, the, in their work environments, but they're exposed at home too, given how prevalent COVID is right now. And if we don't have our workforce to help care for the patients, that's going to have perhaps the largest impact on care delivery across our region. When our, when our healthcare workers are sick or when they have, uh, have to quarantine, it significantly adds to the burden that we're already facing by the influx of patients that are coming in. There is another issue that we need to discuss. When patients come to the emergency room, uh, they are treated for a number of different things, minor to very severe illnesses. 
What we've unfortunately seen is that because of the prevalence of COVID and some of the fear associated with that, we're seeing people neglect coming into the hospital for severe illnesses, things like heart attacks, things like strokes, and they're delaying that care. That often contributes to poorer outcomes and longer hospital stays and even adds to the burden of uh, um, patients that are being seen in the hospital and could prevent us from uh, providing necessary care to other patients. So we want people to come in. We want to assure you that we have many safety measures in place when you come to the emergency department. We use all the protective equipment. We keep distance. We use um, uh, air filtering devices. And what we find is that when we use those devices, people don't get sick. And when we apply those efforts, uh, we actually prevent the, uh, the spread of the disease within the hospital. So we'd ask people to not have that fear. If you have a severe condition that would require you to seek care, please seek care. We also promise that our healthcare workers are doing everything possible in our uh, community to help us get through this, but we desperately need your help. We need the community to, community to engage, the community to use those preventative measures and to really take these warnings so that we don't end up in a worse situation. We're already seeing this increase, but we're capable of flattening the curve. We've already done this once, we can do it again, so we really need everybody to pull together to start seeing an improvement and to reduce the spread and to get us back to our lives as we knew them. We're deeply grateful for all the sacrifices that everybody has already made. We're just asking everybody to keep on keeping on because there is a light at the end of the tunnel. There is a vaccine. It is coming. We will get through this. And if we do it together, the support of the state from Governor DeWine, the support of all of our local uh, community members, the support of our uh, local health department and our health system, we will get through this. So we thank you all very much for everything you've done. And now is just time to buckle down more than ever. And I think that we can take questions. Uh, we have a number of different ways that we surge, both internally and externally, and Seagate Center is something that uh, we had in the plans in the initial phase of this pandemic, so that is something that we can reactivate if, if need be, uh, but we generally don't want to do that if we don't have to. So all hospitals in our area have the ability to surge from within to increase their capacity by using other spaces, by cross-training staff members to work in other areas. And it's much more efficient and much more effective to take care of patients in your own local environment with your own staff members than it is to externalize that. So it's our hope that we won't have to do that, but that is in the playbook and it's something that depending on the situation that we could activate. Yeah, that, that's right. There are predictive models out there that, uh, that really um, show that we are not in the worst phase that we could be in. We happen to be in a worse state right now that we were at the peak of the pandemic when this started. But if you project this outward and you consider the number of people who have actually not contracted the virus yet, the amount of vulnerable people that are out there that are healthy right now that just have not met the virus, there is still a majority of our population that could still get sick and could end up needing hospital care. So the predictive models are, are concerning. And if, uh, if they play out, then um, uh, we could be in, in, in much uh, more serious situation. And if you remember back in the spring, some of those predictive models were very concerning as well. But we took a number of different measures that helped us flatten that curve, and we didn't see what the prediction showed. So this is really the call to action and the ask to everybody to really do those things so that we can do it again. We did it once. We just need to do it again here. We're much closer to a vaccine than we were before. So keep on doing those things so that we can uh, you know, really get through this and uh, get to a point where we can eliminate the disease. Yeah, uh, well, the concept behind flattening the curve is to uh, reduce the rate of transmission. So the amount of people that are getting sick are getting sick at a slower rate so that you drive the virus down below its natural reproductive rate. If left unchecked, the virus reproduces at a rate of about three, meaning that for every one person who gets infected, they infect three other people. By 
uh, by using those methods, those preventive methods, like wearing a mask, keeping our distance, and all those things, we drive that reproductive rate down to one or below. When it gets below one, it actually just starts to go away on its own, and we suppress it to the point where it's no longer in our community. So we drove it down. We got close to that point, but we also reopened. We did a lot of other things and went back to our normal lives because we were trending in the right direction. And then when we opened up significantly, we had uh, uh, an increase in the rate. And now that when you combine that with the fall weather and the fact that people are spending less time outside and getting together again, it's just surging at a rate that, uh, you know, um, uh, is trending, you know, towards a situation that uh, could be unattainable for, for all of us. Doctor, let me, let me answer that one sure. as well, if I could add. Um, uh, let me just try to answer that question as well. Um, Look, Ohioans did exceedingly well um, in the spring. We did exceedingly well in the summer. Uh, we have, up until now, avoided uh, any situation that we've se like we've seen in some other countries, that we've seen in other states where we've been overwhelmed with the health care system. So what is different about this, um, there's good news and bad news. And the bad news is it's more widespread now than we've ever seen it before. Um, the good news is there is help on the way. Uh, for the first time, we now can see the end of this. Uh, it's not going to be for a while, but we're going to start, we hope, vaccinating people in December. Uh, it's going to take a number of months until we get this out to the, you know, enough people in the state of Ohio to start really knocking this thing down. But uh, help is on the way, and it's, it's, it's a good, uh, I think it's a very, very been a good week uh, where we've had two major drug, co drug companies announce that they're going to be able to come out with a, a a vaccine that is 95% um, effective, which is uh, the doctors tell me and the researchers tell me that that's a phenomenally high rate. Um, what I'm asking people to do, uh, we have the curfew. Uh, we are now enforcing the mask in retail establishments. So those are two very, very strong things. But the third thing is we just need to slow down. Uh, we need to slow down our contacts. And if we could reduce in this state, our everybody would try to reduce their contacts by 20, 25 uh, percent over the next few weeks, one day at a time, every day, just try to pull back a little bit. Um, it will go a long way to reduce the spread of this of this virus. So we're in a critical, dangerous time. We have some counties in Ohio where in the last two weeks, uh, one out of every hundred person has been diagnosed with COVID. Uh, so it just it tells us, you know, how widespread this is, but we can battle back. We've battled back in the spring. We battled back in the summer. We can battle back again. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, you're absolutely right. Uh, it is about keeping people to get from getting together after 10 o'clock at night. Now, this virus can spread any time, 24-7. Uh, we don't want to shut the economy down. We don't want to have a total lockdown in Ohio. Why not? Well, there's a lot of bad things that happen when that happens. It means school would be out. No child would be in school. Uh, we know that that increases mental health challenges. We also know... Uh, for example, in the spring when we had the, the shutdown, uh, the incidence of child abuse reporting went down. Now, I don't think anybody thinks that child abuse went down, but the reporting went down because kids were not in school being seen by, by teachers. Um, we saw in the spring uh, more deaths from drug addiction, uh, the economic impact. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of impacts that, you know, we don't want to, if we can avoid it, totally shutting this state down. So we look at what are the things that we can do. Uh, and so last week we, we, we reissued our mask order. It's always been in effect, but now, we're, now we have inspectors out who are in northwest Ohio and every other uh, part of the state who are going into retail establishments. And if you, if you are a 65-year-old uh, person who runs the checkout, uh, and you've got diabetes, you have every right not to have people come in there who are not wearing masks. Uh, and you, you're, you're working eight, nine hours a day. 
uh, it's it's only fair that everybody have a mask on. So when you walk into an establishment today in Ohio, everybody should be having a mask on unless they've got some medical exemption. That's fine if they do. That will make a difference. Uh, we've seen in some of our rural counties where we only had 20, 30 percent mask compliance. We're going to take this up uh, dramatically. We add to that uh what we're doing in regard to weddings what we're doing in regard to funerals again not interfering with weddings not interfering with funerals people can have whoever they want there that's just wonderful but the meal afterwards just has to be conducted in the same way that we conduct our restaurants which is people wear a mask except when they're eating uh it means that people have to be seated uh so these are things that matter we add on top of that uh, a curfew from, from 10 o'clock until 5 a.m. in the morning. It simply means that no retail is going to be open other than maybe a grocery store here or there, maybe a pharmacy here or there, but everything else is be closed down. And basically, everything else is closed down and just basically what uh, means is people need to be home. Uh, and we think that that will, that will help as well. Well, to those who don't want to wear a mask, I would say if it, if it was only about you, uh, yeah, that's your, your decision. Uh, but it's not about you. Uh, it's about you and it's about everybody else. And you can be a spreader. You can have it. You don't know you have it. That's what's so sneaky, so insidious about this virus is that people many times have it. Uh, they don't have symptoms, uh, but yet they can, they can spread it. So it, it for those who say I don't want to wear a mask, uh, you know it's it's not about it's not about you. It's about uh, all the people around you, and really, it's the kind thing to do. It's the right thing to do. And I also look at this mask as kind of a, a an opportunity for freedom. It allows you to go out and, and and do some things that you would not be able to do if you were not wearing a mask. Well, I think the message is starting to resonate. Uh, we're starting to get reports. Uh, I have people out throughout Ohio that more people are wearing masks. Um, after our announcement last Wednesday uh, about uh, the enforcement of the mask rules in retail, we started seeing the increase in people wearing masks in retail. And I think the, the further along we get, uh, people see that there is more spread. Now they're starting to know people who have COVID, starting to know people who have died from COVID. Uh, we didn't see that before. So I think all of these things coming together, uh, Ohioans are going to rally. Uh, they, we did it in the spring. We did exceedingly well in the spring. We did exceedingly well in the summer. Um, you know, we dramatically increased in the summer in July, uh, mask wearing in our urban areas. Uh, we're now starting to see that come come in our rural areas. So I'm I'm optimistic. I think the curfew is going to help. It sends the right signal that this is hey this is not this is no ordinary time. This is an unusual time in our history. We've not seen anything like this in a hundred years in Ohio, and we can get through it. We got to hang in there, and uh, we got to hang in there until the vaccine is here and we start getting the immunization throughout the state. Well, I, th you know, that's a good question. Um, we're not ruling anything out. Um, you know, our goal is to pr protect lives, try to keep people working, uh, protect our schools so that schools can educate our kids, protect our elderly in nursing homes, and protect our hospitals. So, you know, those are the essential goals that we have every day. I will do what, what I have to do to do that. But we don't want to shut down. What we want is a slowdown. And, and so I'm just appealing to everybody slow down, pull back, don't go out as much, stay home more. These are things that we need. And when you do go out, you know, wear a mask. Oh, wait. Maybe. <laughs> It's a slow moving plane.
Why don't you go ahead? I'll try to repeat it. So. Just wait. My hearing's not as good as it was a few years ago. <laughs> we'll wait till it moves out. All right, let's let's try it again. I'm sorry. Right. Yeah. Well, look. I mean, we don't have much time. We have very widespread uh, COVID in Ohio now. Uh, this is this is a train that continues to accelerate, um, and it's just it's it's math. I mean, the more people it goes to, it goes out faster and faster and faster, and we we know that. And so the further it goes out, the harder it is to slow down. But we also know we can slow it down, and we've got the tools. And I think this is the time for Ohioans to rally. This is the time for Ohioans to, you know, say, hey, we got to slow this thing down. And when I say our schools are at stake, I really mean that. What we're starting to see across Ohio is schools that are pulling back. I read just uh, just coming here on the plane, several several schools pulling back literally yesterday and saying we're going remote now. And they're having to do that because the, it's so widespread in the community. Uh, they're not able to find bus drivers. They're not able to get teachers. They've got too many kids quarantined. So I think what we have to do is think in our own lives and in the life of this state, what is important to us? You know, what do we really value? Don't we value education? Don't we value uh, protecting our grandparents or, who are in a nursing home? You know, don't we value having the hospitals that are open so that they can do the elective surgery and the things that, that all of us need? Uh, all of these things are at risk. And so we need to rally. We need to do what we need to do. Um, it, there, there could become a point where, yes, we will have to go to a, a shutdown as we did in the spring. I, that, that's not what we want to do. Uh, doing it the second time um, is more harmful than the first time. Uh, many businesses will simply go out of business if we do this. Many people will lose their jobs. We have many more people unemployed. And we have no backup unemployment So coming from the federal government. So what we, one of the things we hope, uh, and I've talked to, you know, many of the members of the congressional delegation, uh, we hope that they will get a bill uh, because a bill is, is very important. This lame duck session, there's no reason that Republicans and Democrats cannot come together to, to pass a bill, and that will, that will help us a lot. But without that bill, uh, things are very, very tough, particularly as this economy um, you know, may slow down. You know, one of the things that will happen, uh, whether I order it or not, if people are afraid to go out, this economy just starts slowing down. And, and so uh, we've we got to get hold of this. Now is a, this is a crucial, crucial time in our battle against this, this virus, a very crucial time. Yeah, I don't think anybody really knows. I mean, we're going to start, we hope we start in December, uh, but by the time, uh, you know, I've heard estimates of March, April, uh, by the time we get to the point where the average Ohio and we can roll it out. I mean, we're going to get, you know, the most vulnerable populations as we go, but for the average Ohioan, you know, it could be late spring. I don't think anybody knows, knows for sure, but I'm much more optimistic today than I was two weeks ago. We now have two virus, two vaccines that are clearly moving uh, and that look like they're going to be, be coming out December and January. Well, first of all, no one, no one has, we've not, in any of our health orders, have not imposed any kind of um, jail time. Uh, look, no one is going to be concerned that if you take your dog out at, at, at 10, 15 and walk outside, uh, let it go to the bathroom or take it a walk. No one's going to care about that. What we don't want is people coming together um, and coming together uh, where there, there can be spread. So it's, it's a timeout. It's an opportunity for us to pull back for seven hours in a 24-hour day. 
uh, to try to break this. And, and, you know, for those who, you know, have or are critical of this, I understand. But we have to do some things in Ohio. And I would just say that lives are at stake. <laughs> and it's not just lives. As the doctor said, you know, he's got, he has patients. I just left a doctor in, in Cedarville who has patients um, who now have long-term, apparently permanent medical problems because of this virus. They don't show up on any chart. They don't show up in the death category. Uh, they're recovered, quote, unquote. So they don't show up and they're in the hospital anymore. But they're facing a lifetime that has been fundamentally changed. Uh, they may have a heart condition. They may have a, you know, their their ability to breathe compromised dramatically. So, uh, th this is not some game. This is this is life and death. This is serious, um, and we have it within our power to do some basic things that can knock this virus down. Well, the, the whole principle behind the curfew, as uh, you heard Governor DeWine say, is to reduce the, the time that we have people in contact with each other. We know that that is by far the most powerful way that this illness spreads. So people talk about surfaces and buildings and things like that. It's human-to-human -human contact that does it. And we know that after 10 p.m., that type of contact that we see tends to be closer, more intimate, and when you mix that with alcohol, people's inhibitions go down, their likelihood to adhere to those measures uh, go down. So uh, we think that uh, any type of action that's going to re reduce that human-to-human -human contact, uh, we, we know factually that you don't need data to, to tell you that those type of things reduce the spread of the illness. Uh, well, in a similar fashion to what Governor DeWine just uh, described, uh, as the state has a whole arsenal of things that uh, they could use to help reduce the, the, the spike that we're seeing right now, the hospitals have that too. So that's just one other tool in the tool belt that we would deploy if needed. And it's one of those things that we absolutely don't want to do that. We want to continue to provide the care that people need. We call them elective procedures, but sometimes they're extremely necessary. We say elective, they're just not emergent. They might be absolutely necessary. So those are the things that the community depends on, and we want to continue to do that. But it is one of those things that's on the plate as a tool to perhaps use uh, in the event that we get to the point that we're becoming overwhelmed. Well, a, a couple things. Um, first of all, it's, uh, it's somewhat difficult to identify COVID. Uh, it, it sounds like it might be simple. We all know what the symptoms are, but sometimes people come in with symptoms that are just a little bit different, a little bit off, and after we do a little bit of investigation, we find COVID. But what we've done, and, and, and the benefit of going through this in the spring, is we've learned how to equip our facilities and how to um, uh, create processes that uh, protect the healthcare providers and protect patients and family members from being exposed. So we've changed the way that we handle air in our facilities. We've changed in the way the way that we. Uh, uh, put our patients in waiting rooms. We have separate areas. We've changed the way that uh, our healthcare uh, providers approach patients. We all wear a mask, if not an N95, in uh, every single room now. And we have procedures for reducing transmission, not only to ourselves as healthcare providers, but to other family members. So uh, we've benefited from having been through this in the first round, uh, and we can use those techniques to all of the patients coming in, whether they have a suspicion of COVID or another illness or just coming in for an elective procedure that we use to protect everybody.
Yeah, across the board, we've all had to do that. So every hospital in the system has uh, a COVID unit, and uh, we've had to expand it in a number of different hospitals that uh, um, uh, that are all seeing COVID patients right now. Anybody else? Um, it, really, we don't want government uh, knocking on people's doors and asking them what they're doing. Um, so no, we, we don't, uh, there's no way that we can, can or should patrol what people do in their individual um, lives. Uh, but, you know, I, I think everyone should remember that uh, when you're with someone, uh, you don't know whether they have a virus or not. And what is really human nature? Now, what we find is human nature is that when we're with family or friends, we're not as careful. Uh, and so we just have to be careful. Uh, that we can still do a lot of things if we wear a mask, and we just have to be careful about that. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, this is six. Uh, I'm in six cities. I go from here to Cleveland, then to Youngstown and uh, Columbus. Uh, Cincinnati, I started uh, at, at my home in the Dayton Media Market uh, in Cedarville. So this is our second stop, and here, from here we go, to, we go to Cleveland. So thank you, thank you all very much.